Forecast number five. From Hollywood, California, the Columbia Broadcasting System presents a new idea in mystery comedies, written by Keith Fowler and Frank Galen, starring the screen's outstanding interpreters of sophisticated comedy, Adolf Monjou and Viri Teasdale. <laughs> Productions Deluxe, starring Adolf Monjou as that urbane sleuth, Roger Boone, who follows clues, blondes, and the horses with equal enthusiasm. And Marie Teasdale as Twyla Boone, his almost ever-loving wife. Roger Boone's great success as a detective is due to a combination of talents. First, his powers of observation are remarkable. He never overlooks a detail, no matter how small or trivial it may seem. All right, Twyla. Are we ready to go out now? Well, not quite, dear. What's the matter? But don't you think you'd better put on your trousers? <laughs> no wonder the name of Roger Boone's agency, Deductions Deluxe, is on the lips of everyone these days. No wonder the man in the street discusses Roger Boone's cases with his neighbor. Say, that Roger Boone's quite a guy, ain't he? Did you hear about how he polished off three cases last week? Yes. One murder, one robbery, and one scotch. <laughs> More than once has Roger Boone aided the baffled police of a great metropolis... City detectives know that when they're up against a stone wall, the smart thing to do is call in Roger Boone. Looks like us cops are stumped again, Boone. You got any theories about the murderer? Well, Lieutenant, if you see an extremely beautiful girl, about five feet seven, with blue eyes, blonde hair, and a dimple in her left cheek, hold her for me. What? Is that a description of the murderer? No, just hold her for me. <laughs> Tonight, we examine one of the more unique cases from the files of Roger Boone, the colorful crime known as the problem of the painted poodle, or who gave Fluffy the brush. Our story opens in the home of the Boones, where Roger, little knowing what is in store for him that day, is struggling with a frightful problem of his own. Well, good morning, my little man. My, don't we look repulsive this morning. Please, Twyla, my head, oh. Oh, Roger, must you wear that dressing gown? It goes so badly with your face. Two different shades of green. Go away, <laughs> go away. Have you no respect for the dead? Oh, if my head doesn't stop aching, I'll have to have it extracted. If you think it aches now, just wait until you open your eyes. I'm not going to. Not until fall. Oh, come on. Is it worth the agony? After all, I've seen everything. Open them up, Roger. Oh, all right. Oh, good. Now the other one. Ah! <laughs> What's that horrible yellow stuff all over the floor? Sunshine. Pull the curtains quick. <laughs> oh. oh, that's better. I'll never do it again. I swear I'll never do it again. Drink? No, open my eyes. Now, Roger, I don't want to sound like a nag. Well, then don't say anything, dear. But must you act like this country still has prohibition? Mixing my drinks is what did it. I should have stuck to scotch and soda. What did you switch to? Scotch and water. <laughs> Pour me some awfully black coffee, will you, dear? Did you gamble last night as if I didn't know? Well, I, uh, I took a small flyer. Mm -hmm. How much did you lose? Mm, two dollars. Roger? All right, two fifty. I plunged. How about the coffee? I suppose you went to the ivory club again? Well, yes. And you call yourself a detective. Everybody knows that Frankie Giovanni runs a crooked gambling house. Yes, I know that, too. Then why do you continue to go there? Well, it's the only club in town that's got a free parking lot. That's not the reason. You just can't resist gambling even when you know you can't win. Twyla, coffee, 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 coffee! Oh, Roger. Do you know the address of a good alienist? I need one. Why, darling? Oh, because I'm still terribly in love with you. <laughs> I know I'm not the best husband in the world. No. But what does it matter as long as you think so and I think so? Kiss? No. Oh, come on. Kiss me madly upon Miss sensuous lips. Oh, I can't even see your sensuous lips. The sensuous bags under your eyes hides them. <laughs> Just one of my clever disguises, dear. I made up to look like a member of cafe society. For my sake, couldn't you disguise yourself permanently as Errol Flynn? <laughs> Here's your coffee. Where's the sugar? Under your nose, Sherlock. What a detective. If you ever found anything in your life, I don't know. Could you answer the phone, dear? I'm not dressed. <laughs> Hello? Yes? Yes, this is Mr. Boone's secretary. 
Mrs. Ordway? Mrs. Gerald Ordway? Oh, yes. Well, oh, I see. Yes. <gasps> Why, that's terrible. Mr. Boone will certainly look into it. Oh, right away, Mrs. Ordway. And may I say that I'm terribly sorry. Goodbye. Who is Mrs. Ordway? Haven't you ever heard of Gerald Ordway? He founded one of the biggest breakfast food concerns in the country, Boxy Topsies. What's wrong with him? He's dead. Murdered? No, he died six years ago of pneumonia. And may I add that he probably looks better this morning than you do. Yes, uh, but if he's been dead for six years... Oh, Mrs. Ordway's late husband has nothing to do with the case. This is something far more important to a lady than any mere husband. More important to her, I imagine, than anything in the world. Well, what is it? Somebody painted a pet poodle green. Now, stop mumbling. It sounded like you said somebody painted a pet poodle green. Well, that's what I said. Mrs. Ordway doesn't like it. Well, how about the poodle? Well, she won't talk. Poor <laughs> dimpled, fluffy ruffles of peekaboo Dell. Poor dimpled witcher, for heaven's sakes, what? That's the name of the unfortunate pooch. Dimpled, fluffy ruffles of peekaboo Dell. Well, well. So the person who used to name Pullman cars is now christening poodles. What am I supposed to do? Unmask the poodle painter, of course. Ridiculous. I'm a detective, not a veterinary. Go inside and get your clothes on. The wealthy Mrs. Ordway is waiting for us. I won't do it. You heard what I said. Get your clothes on. All right. But if I hear one word from you about my business going to the dogs, I'll never take another chaser. <laughs> There it is, Ordway Manor. Hmm, quite a place. Oh, I don't know. It's only 28 rooms, 12 baths, servants' quarters, two tennis courts, and a swimming pool. Ah, yes, but it's home. <laughs> well, come on. Don't you want to go in? Well, not for a minute. There's something going on in the back that looks interesting. A man washing a dog. Any particular color dog? No, just the usual green. Uh, let's have a look. I've never seen a green dog before that wouldn't go away if I took an aspirin. Well, this one won't go away. It's probably the dog we were called here to investigate. Well, if we don't see any other green dogs, we'll investigate this one. <laughs> the washing doesn't seem to be doing much good. Poor Fluffy Ruffles is still awfully verdant. Yes, she does look a bit like springtime in the Rockies. Hello. Oh, hello. Any of it coming off? Some. You should have seen it this morning. Who found her and how high did he jump? I did, in six feet. <laughs> how did it happen, do you know? No, sir. But I'd like to shake the meat of the guy that done it. You don't uh, care for little Fluffy? She's the worst excuse for a dog I've ever seen. I come here as a chauffeur and wind up as a nursemaid to this flea bag. <laughs> Mrs. Ordway seems to be fond of her. Yeah, she's nuts about the hound. On account of it, won a ribbon in a dog show once. I think the judges must have been stewed. Can she do any tricks? Oh, sure. If you holler, hey, Fluffy, she'll run right up and bite you. <laughs> How long have you been scrubbing her? A couple hours. Miss Alice was helping me till a few minutes ago. Miss Alice? Yeah, she's Mrs. Ordway's niece. She got green paint all over her slack, so she wanted to change. Well, thanks for the information. You are, uh, Hogan. Jerry Hogan, the chauffeur. Well, perhaps we'll see you later, Hogan. Come, light of my life. Well, what do you make of it, Sherlock? Pretty obvious. Somebody painted the dog green. How about Hogan? He and Fluffy had had words. That's a possibility. Hogan may have been grooming her for the St. Patrick's Day parade. Ring the doorbell, dear. I'll bet you a dollar even that a man opens the door. If it's a woman, you win. <laughs> Don't you ever stop gambling. All right, it's a bet. Yes, what is it, please? Oh, oh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, I'm Mrs. Gerald Ordway. Obviously a woman. The dollar, please. Well, you can't hit me for trying. Uh, Mrs. Ordway, I am Mr. Boone, and this is my wife. Her name is Mrs. Boone. Oh, of course, the detective. I do hope you'll pardon this informality opening my own door. But I told the servants yesterday that they could have today off, and everything's in a dreadful muddle. Oh, Mr. Boone, this frightful thing. Yes, ghastly. I'm so glad you've come, Mr. Boone. Poor Fluffy. She'll never get over this. She's always hated green so. She bit me once just because I was drinking limeade. Oh, please, come into the drawing room. Of course, there may not be any clues there, but it's such a nice sunny room. Oh, Oliver, these are the detectives I ordered. Mr. and Mrs. Boone, this is my friend, Mr. Oliver Trout. A fellow dog lover. How do you How do? You do? How do you do? Now, uh, see here, Boone, I feel that your presence is, is undesirable. Mrs. Ordway's in a highly nervous state, and you'll only excite her further. But she asked us to come. And I advised against it. I feel that Mrs. Ordway should reimburse Mr. Boone for his time and trouble to dismiss him at once. Good. A splendid idea, Mr. Trout. Now, surely, Mr. Trout, you don't want the fiend who outraged dear Fluffy to go unpunished, do you? Why don't you shut up? Uh, uh, definitely not, Mrs. Boone, but I, I prefer to track down the criminal myself. 
My heart bleeds over the indignity Fluffy has suffered. Yes, what happened to Fluffy shouldn't happen to a dog. <laughs> oh, dear, I don't know what to say. Poor darling Fluffy. She would surely have had another blue ribbon if this hadn't happened. What's this? Yes. Fluffy was entered in the Silver Point Kennel Show today, and that's why I gave all the servants a day off. I didn't expect to be here. So Fluffy couldn't appear on account of wet paint, eh? Why, that may be a motive. Mrs. Ordway, did any other dog fanciers know that Fluffy was to be an entry? Not many. I've never shown before at Silver Point, but everyone who had ever seen Fluffy conceded that she was a certain winner. Hmm. Uh, do you know anyone intimately who also had a dog entered in this show? No, no one. Uh, oh, only Mr. Trout. Only Mr. Trout. <laughs> well, well. Uh, why, th th this is preposterous. Now, see here, Boone. Me? Well, I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. You said that I'm glad to see Fluffy out of that show so my dog would have a chance. No, I never said that. You said it. Well, what's the difference? Who said it? It's true, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, I mean, it's a lie. Why, I'd rather cut off my right arm. Oh, no, no, than... there, there, Mr. Trout. You haven't been accused of anything. Well. Is your dog also a poodle? Yes, uh, same class as Fluffy. Oh, Oliver. How could you have done such a thing? But, Laura, I didn't do it. I didn't. Uh, you didn't? No. You, uh, you do believe me, don't you? Of course I believe you, Oliver. Oh. But couldn't you have made it some other color? What? You know how she hates me. Oh, uh, oh, I give up. Mr. Boone, I don't know what Mrs. Ordway's paying you to investigate this case, but I will double the amount if you apprehend the culprit. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Roger, the time has come to disguise yourself as a detective. A detective? Well, how interesting. Why didn't you tell me, Aunt Laura? Oh, hello, dear. Yes, I hired Mr. Boone to find the nasty person who persecuted Fluffy. Mr. Boone, this is my niece, Alice Mason. Well, 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 how do you do, Miss Mason? How do you do? Take it easy, dear. There's no need to act like an unemployed gigolo. <laughs> has lived with me for years, ever since my dear sister passed away. And now she's practically like my own child. Oh, she's been such a comfort to me. She looks like she'd be a great comfort to anyone. <laughs> Miss Mason, um, haven't we met somewhere before? No, I don't think so. Roger, isn't it about time you introduced me? Oh, yes. Uh, Miss Mason, this is my assistant, Miss Hamacher. <laughs> The name, Miss Mason, is Twyla Boone. A uh, Mrs. Boone? Stool pigeon. Oh, I'm very glad to know you, Mrs. Boone. Please pardon me if there's any green paint in my hand. I've been trying to clean up the victim. So we heard. Oh, isn't that a stunning emerald bracelet? Well, thank you. It is beautiful, isn't it? Why, Alice, it's so nice to see the bracelet again. You don't often wear it now. Well, it's rather old-fashioned, Aunt Laura. But you know I love it. It was her dear mother's bracelet, Mrs. Boone. It's been in the family for years and years. I have emerald earrings to match, too. Look. See? Oh, they're gorgeous. They certainly are. You should wear your hair back so the public would always see them. Perhaps. But I like my hair this way. My dear Miss Mason, I'd like your hair even if you had it up in curlers. Are you sure we haven't met before? <laughs> Same old 1914 technique. Stick around, Miss Mason. It'll show you his tin badge that says chicken inspector. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Boone, any theories about the dastardly paint job? Uh, uh, no, uh, no, Mr. Boone hasn't been able to discover a thing. Oh, poor Fluffy. It's so horrible to see her sitting there looking like something out of Walt Disney. From now on, the very thought of green paint will haunt me. Oh, by the way, Alice, you still have a spot on your leg. Where? There, under your left knee. Oh, Roger, you're getting old. A leg, and you missed it. <laughs> oh, dear, and I thought I'd scrubbed it all off. Excuse me, Mrs. Hardway. Hogan, I have told you never to come in here without ringing first on the household. I know, I know, but this guy talked me into it. Guy? What guy? This one behind me with a mask on. Yeah, I persuade him. Well, I, 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 I'm busy now, and I can't be interrupted. Both of you may leave at once. Shut the door. Hogan. Now, see here, my man. Shut I... the door, Hogan. Yes. I'll reach all of you. Oh, he's got a gun. Young man, what is the meaning of this intrusion? It ain't no intrusion, lady. It's a heist. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Permit me to explain, Mrs. Ordway. In this gentleman's social set, a holdup is known as a heist. In other words, we are about to be robbed. How utterly vulgar. Hogan, did you suspect that this man intended to rob us? Well, I seen his mask, and I know it wasn't Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> then why did you let him in? He also seen his gun, and he knew it wasn't Armistice Day. Oh, come on, come on. I'm a busy man. I ain't got all day. You scoundrel, you'll pay for this outrage. That'll I... be enough out of you, Pop. Now, just hold still and it'll be over before you know it. Okay, ladies first. Oh, that's what I like. Culture. <laughs> the lady on the divan is your hostess. Why don't you start with her? It's a pleasure. 
You got any ice, lady? Ice? Does the man expect me to serve him a highball? <laughs> not at all, Mrs. Ordway, not at all. In his language, ice means uh, any form of jewelry. Oh, you've been around, ain't you, buddy? Mm, I've had my moments. Okay, I'll try it your way. Have you got any form of jewelry, lady? <laughs> no, no, I... Oh, yes, wait. I do have a silver hat pin. Oh, but it wouldn't look at all nice on you. Mm. Well, never mind, never mind. Well, who's next? How about you, sister? You've been sitting there mighty quiet. Oh, please, I have nothing you'd want. Now, don't give me that. I can use that bracelet and them earrings, too. Come on, come on. Fork them over. Okay, that's more like it. Now, is it my turn now? Right. That ain't a bad-looking sparkler on your left hand, Queenie. Engagement ring? Yes, there's a wedding ring under it. I always get my man. That's quite a rock. Looks like it come right out of Tiffany's window. Well, if it did, it was part of the window. <laughs> <laughs> You mean it's a hunk of glass? Just that. When I'm not wearing it, I lend it to the neighborhood boy scout troop to signal with. <laughs> well, what do you know? Imagine a guy pulling a stunt like that on a good-looking mouse like you. Roger, I've made a conquest. He thinks I'm a good-looking mouse. You're much too easily flattered, Twyla. Women have called me a handsome rat, and it never turned my head. <laughs> what are you to her, buddy? Her husband. The guy that slipped at a phony ring? Mm-hmm. Ain't you ashamed? <laughs> you ought to have more sentiment. Oh, you're absolutely right. Sure I'm right. If he had more sentiment, I'd have a diamond ring. <laughs> you got any dough in that purse? My weekly allowance. I'll tell you what I'll do. You give me half and you keep half, huh? All right. How much is half of 75 cents? <laughs> 75 cents? Does that only give you? My wife has another budget to cover household expenses. That 75 cents is just for foolish luxuries. Now, let me see. Uh, half of 75 is 37 and a half. I'll toss you for the odd penny. Never mind, never mind. Forget it with my compliments. Well, that takes care of the dames. Who's next? Here's 11 books. No, no, no. Not you, pal. Put it away. Put it away. Oh, an honest working man's money ain't good enough for you. Yeah, sure, pal. But if you know I what... thought you was making class distinction, I'd ram this 11 books down your throat. Oh, don't get excited. Comes the revolution, I'll stick you up. <laughs> All right. Now, you, Pop, where's your kick? He means your wallet, Mr. Trout. Okay, wallet. If I stay around here much longer, I'll be talking like a Yale man. Oh, not that. There are ladies present. The, the wallet, Pop. Yeah, thanks. Now, see here, you thug. Skip I Skip it, uh... skip it. Yes. Well, buddy, looks like you're the only one left. Now that you mention it, I am. You are what? The only one left of that old gang of mine. <laughs> ah, what a gang that was. You used to run with a mob? Ah, yes. There was Eddie and Skinny and Waldo and Spike. There was Slugsy and Cecil and Willie and Mike. They, they sound like a swell bunch of gorillas. Ah, the best, and now they're gone. The old corner is deserted, the pool room is empty. Oh, gee, that's tough. And here I am, the last of the old gang. Weary, heartsick, trudging down that lonesome road. <laughs> I know just how you feel, buddy. <laughs> Once I was... Hey, hey what you trying to slip behind that pillar? Your wallet, huh? So that's why you was handing out the sob story. Oh, just in time, too. Another minute and your eyes would have been dim with tears. Trying to take my mind off my work, huh? You must have a load of jack in this thing if you went to all that trouble. Let me see. Six bucks. Well, I'll be a... Hey, hey, Queenie. I always get a bang out of robbing the rich and giving to the poor. You take it. Why, thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You see, when I was a kid, my old lady read me about Robin Hood. Mm, what do you think of that, Roger? Well, I'm sorry his mother ever learned to read. <laughs> well, I guess that cleans up the job. Now, all you got to do is sit tight for ten minutes. On account of, I don't want to have to shoot nobody. <laughs> and so long, folks. And no hard feelings! <laughs> so long, Robin Hood. Give my regards to Friar Tuck. Hogan, follow that man. Stop him. Well, well, do something, Hogan. I'm doing something. I'm pretending like I never heard a word. And to <laughs> think, until this moment, I was convinced that crime didn't pay. Oh, dear. Fluffy Ruffles painted green, and now Alice's emeralds stolen. Oh, now, now, Aunt oh, Laura. They may turn up in some pawn shop, and if not, they were insured, you know. Were they fully covered by insurance, Miss Mason? Yes, Mr. Boone. I have a $5,000 policy with a safeguard company. Very fortunate. You were lucky, too, Twyla. Imagine Robin Hood falling for that gag about the glass ring. <laughs> it really is a diamond, isn't it? Well, of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> Remind me to have it appraised. 
How dare you call yourself a detective, Boone? You're so incompetent that crime runs rampant in your very presence. I agree with you, Mr. Boone. You haven't acted like my notion of a detective. Well, now, how do you expect a detective to act? Well, I, I thought if he saw a robbery, he'd just make a deduction and then go to the telephone and tell the police who did it. Well, all right, Mrs. Ordway. May I use this telephone? Uh, uh, surely you're not serious, Boone. Oh, no. He just wants to call the pot of gold and tell them he can be reached at this number. Quiet, dear. Hello, 15th Precinct. Connect me with the detective bureau, please. Huh? This better be good. It will. Hello, is this uh, Lieutenant Lloyd there? Oh, it's you, Mac. Now, this is Roger Boone. Oh, I don't want a ticket fixed. I want to do something for you this time. You know the Ivory Club, of course. That's right. Frankie Giovanni's place. Well, if you drop in there tonight, you'll find an emerald bracelet and a pair of emerald earrings that don't belong to Frankie. Yes. Also a wallet belonging to a Mr. Oliver Trout. No, Frankie didn't steal them himself, but he hired someone to do the job. Well, it's a long story, Mac. I'll give you the details later. Goodbye. Why, Mr. Boone, how perfectly marvelous. Oh, it's a bluff, I'll wager. He's trifling with the dignity of the law. Now, see here, Trout. When my husband speaks to a policeman and gives his right name, he knows what he's doing. Thank you, my sweet. But it's also amazing. An ivory club and a man named Frankie and Mr. Boone figured it all out just by being robbed. Isn't it wonderful, Alice? Now you'll get your emeralds back. I... Well, I hardly know what to say. Uh, you'll have to prove it, Boone. I'm still from Missouri. Very well. I'll have to begin by explaining why Mrs. Ordway's poodle was painted green and by whom. My goodness, do you know? Yes, the problem of the poodle only required elimination. First, I eliminated you, Mrs. Ordway... Naturally, you wouldn't have used the paintbrush. Of course not. I I'm not at all handy around the house. And next, I eliminated Hogan because he isn't that subtle. His mind would run to something more direct, such as feeding the animal arsenic. Yeah, or running it through a meat chopper. <laughs> Gruesome, but uh, typical. Next, I considered Mr. Trout. Now, see here, Boone. Now, your motive was clear, sir. With Fluffy out of the way, your own dogs stood a good chance of taking top show honors. Oh, Oliver, how could you have done such a thing? Now, Laura, I didn't do it. I didn't. Uh, you didn't? No. Uh, you do believe me, don't you? Wait, don't answer that. There's no need for an answer, Mr. Trout. You're out of it. Although you are a stuffed shirt and a pompous old windbag, you do love dogs. Well, that's more like it. <laughs> what suspense, Mr. Boone. I, I've never been so... Ex uh, Alice... What's wrong, dear? Where are you going? Oh, my head, Aunt Laura. The, the excitement and the strain. I, I'm going to my room. Poor child. But how can you bear to miss Mr. Boone's story? I'd rather that you stayed for it, Miss Mason. This is not your home, Mr. Boone. You have no authority here. No, but I'd rather make my accusation in your presence. Accusation? Yes. Miss Mason was the fiend with the paintbrush. No, I wasn't. Alice... Oh, no. You've gone too far this time, Boone. You know, my father said those exact words to Roger eight years ago. The next day we were married. I have proof of Miss Mason's guilt. First, uh, that daub of green paint on her very lovely leg. Was that? Why, you said yourself I must have got it when Hogan and I tried to clean Fluffy. Yes, but later I remembered something Hogan said before I met you. If you please, Hogan, repeat your remark about Miss Mason and the green paint. I said she got it all over her. All over her what? All over her. Say she had on... Exactly. Hogan said that when Miss Mason helped him with a dog, she got paint all over her slacks. If she was wearing slacks, her legs would have been covered. Therefore, she must have got the paint on her leg at some previous time. Well, I'll be done. Move over, Hogan, and I'll be done with you. Alice <laughs> Mason, you've been a naughty girl. How could you be so cruel to poor little Fluffy? I have nothing to say, Aunt Laura. If you want to believe this man's wild theories, that's entirely up to you. Yes, yeah, she's right, Boone. It's only a theory. Just why should she do such a thing? Aha, uh -huh, for a very clever reason. Suppose the dog hadn't been painted. Who would be in this house today? Would you, Mrs. Ordway? Why, no, I'd be at the dog show. Well, so would I, for that matter. Me too, playing nursemaid to the mutt. And my wife and I naturally would not be here. That's right. I had a date with Yvonne, my dressmaker, for four o'clock. And I had one with her for five. In other words, <laughs> if a touch of color hadn't come into Fluffy's life... Miss Mason would have been here alone. Well? In that case, there would have been no masked bandit and no holdup. Now I'm beginning to see. Roger, this is a gem. Yes, isn't it? You see, Alice arranged that holdup herself. But it was no good unless she had witnesses. So she painted the dog green to make sure you'd be here when the robbery arrived, Mrs. Ordway. As a reliable, disinterested witness, your account of the holdup would keep the insurance company from getting suspicious. And the rest of us being here made the plan even better. More good, honest witnesses. Are you sure, Mr. Boone? I... I'm very fond of Alice. I'm sorry. 
But any doubt I might have had disappeared when the bandit made a slip. Think, Twyla, did you catch it? Oh, for heaven's sake, stop gloating. You look like Joe DiMaggio coming to bat in a girl's softball game. <laughs> All right, what slip did the bandit make? Well, when he came to Miss Mason, he took the bracelet and then, without hesitation, demanded the earrings, too. Demanded earrings he couldn't see. Why couldn't he? I saw them. You saw them. True, but not until Miss Mason pulled her hair aside and showed them to us. <laughs> you win. I think I'll move into a home for the feeble-minded and knit sweaters. In a home for the feeble-minded, someone might even wear them. Now, that completes my case, Mrs. Ordway. The bandit obviously knew in advance what he had come to steal, and only Miss Mason could have furnished the information. Oh, stop. Please stop. Now, I'm not as sad as Miss Mason. I haven't enjoyed this. Then it, it's true, Alice. Yes, it's true. It's all true. I had to have a lot of money. Ten thousand dollars. I had to have it by tonight. Yes, Frankie Giovanni wanted both the jewels and the insurance money, and he doesn't like to wait. Well, how did you know it was Giovanni? Well, now, if you recall, Miss Mason, when we were introduced, I asked if we hadn't met before. Now, my charming wife thought that I had certain motives, but I was innocent. Well, there has to be a first time for everything, as Papa Dion said to Dr. Defoe. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I was puzzled, but the picture cleared up. We hadn't met, but I had seen you at the Ivy Club. You were playing the wheel, Miss Mason, and uh, losing. Mm, and as the world's greatest authority on losing, you should know. You were gambling, Alice? Yes. And I never won. Never. First he took the emeralds. That's why you haven't seen me wearing them for such a long time. I tried to win enough to get them back, and I couldn't. Not many people win from Frankie. Why, there's so much electricity in his roulette wheels that the coupiers have to wear rubber gloves. Yes. <laughs> round and round the little ball goes, and where it stops, Frankie always knows. I lost eight thousand, nine, ten, and he said that was too much. I had to pay by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Today. Was the fake robbery his idea? Yes. I didn't want to do it, but he said he was desperate. It was either that or he'd he'd do things. He even threatened to to kidnap Aunt Laura. Oh, he really must have been desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you tell me, Alice? I couldn't. You've always been so good to me, and I I didn't want you to know. May I go to my room now? I won't run away. I'll come with you, dear. Mr. Boone, uh, will she... Will they send her... I don't think so. Talk it over and see what can be done. And I'm sure the lieutenant will be reasonable. Frankie is the boy he wants. Thank you. Uh, Hogan will show you out. Uh, Boone, may I say a word? But certainly, Mr. Trout. Boone, your handling of this case was masterly. That's what it was. Masterly. No, I thought it was fairly brilliant myself. <laughs> You'll hate it when they finally put you in that straitjacket. You won't be able to pat yourself on the back. Oh, he has reason to be proud. Just look what he's done. Thanks, man. Wait. What have I done? Oh, this is dreadful. What's the matter? Oh, this is terrible. Twyla, I've been a fool. Why? But I've closed up Frankie Giovanni's Ivory Club. Now, where can I go? I'm homeless. <laughs> That, ladies and gentlemen, is how Roger and Twyla Boone unravel their first tangled problem, the first, at least, to be overheard by the radio audience. It will not, we hope, be the last, for Adolph Morgeau and Marie Teasdale have a great many more of their deductions de luxe ready for you, if you like this idea and want it to come to the air as a regular weekly series. There's the problem of the elderly juvenile, or which of the chorus girls had a wooden leg, for instance, and the affair of the lisping corpse, or should a hearse have an outboard motor? <laughs> Write to CBS and tell us how you feel about this series idea, conceived, written, and produced by Frank Galen and Keith Fowler. The music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Marjou and Miss Teasdale, who played Roger and Twyla Boone with their unequal deftness and charm, were supported by Verna Felton as our dreadfully confused Mrs. Ordway. Ed Max was the Robin Hood from Hoboken, Jerry Moore as Hogan, who loves to bite dogs, Kathleen Fitz, who played Alice, this season's prettiest criminal, and Arthur Q. Bryan as Mr. Trout, the big leash and muzzle man. Next Monday, same time, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present its sixth in the forecast series, Song Without End, a full hour from New York which brings a new treatment of the romantic side of the world's great music to the air. Song Without End will present one of America's great young stars of stage, screen, and radio, Burgess Meredith as Claude Debussy, with Margot as the heroine of Debussy's fascinating love story. <laughs> the next Monday, then, in forecast number six, this is Frank Goss. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>